Hello, this is Eastern Europe Review, a joint production of Belsat and TVP World, with reports and analysis from Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. I'm Alexandra Shapalina and these are the main stories. Prigozhin's death. Widespread belief that Putin ordered liquidation. This was the only person with his private military company, Wagner, who could counterbalance our government. They took away the last faith. Lukashenko's wishful thinking. Belarus seeks to join BRICS. Lukashenko wants to get out of isolation apart from everything else. He needs to fly somewhere on his Boeing before an arrest warrant from The Hague is issued. Battle for a piece of Russian beach, locals versus children's camp directorate and its connection with war in Ukraine. In order to go to my own house now, I have to show my pass, a residence pass. It says here that I am a resident. The most significant event of the past week was the plane crash in the Tver region near Moscow carrying top leadership figures of the so-called Wagner private military company, Evgeny Prigozhin and Dmitry Utkin. What makes this event remarkable is the unanimous belief shared by both critics and supporters of the Russian regime that it was a deliberate assassination. There is no ambiguity about the responsible party either. The general consensus is that this is an act of vengeance orchestrated by Vladimir Putin. There appears to be a logical outcome to the events which took place two months ago with Prigozhin's march to Moscow. One way or another, the Z community, referring to the supporters of war, arrived at a more or less consolidated conclusion. Neither Ukraine nor the collective West, nor the insidious NATO bloc, had any involvement in the murder of Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagnerites. He was killed by his political father the Russian president. This is widely understood in Russia because it is common knowledge that Putin does not forgive betrayal. The Grey Zone Telegram channel, associated with the Wagner Group, claims that Prigozhin and his right hand, Dmitry Utkin, were killed by traitors to Russia. The following post appeared on the social media of the Nationalist Air Assault Reconnaissance Brigade named Rusich. Let this be a lesson to everyone. You always have to go to the end. The so-called military correspondent, Roman Saponkov, wrote that the death of the head of the PMC will greatly affect Russian soldiers. The assassination of Prigozhin will have catastrophic consequences. The people who gave the order don't understand the mood in the army and the morale at all. The death of Prigozhin has indeed caused a sense of despair among the Russian military. This is how the people of Russia reacted to Prigozhin's death. We felt protected. Of course, we had Prigozhin. We knew that he would protect us. How much he did for us, for the people, for Russia. He's gone, and I don't know what to expect. My personal opinion is that nothing happens to such people by chance. Today we mourn. This was the only person with his private military company, Wagner, who could counterbalance our government. They took away the last faith. If there were any hopes for changes in the future in the country, now there are none. For me, this is human grief for our great Russia. It was an accident. I think everything was sanctioned. He couldn't just suddenly die by himself. This could be, I think, a game. I read there was another plane, just like this one, and he could have been on another plane. It's not like they found him there. Nothing is really known about the second plane, which took off immediately after Prigozhin's aircraft 
and then, right after the incident, turned around in the sky and returned to Moscow. This is one of the darkest aspects of this whole story. It is strange that there is no data on who was on board this aircraft, what happened to them, whether there was anyone there at all. Because, you see, people are prone to conspiracy theories that Prigozhin could have been on the second plane. Meanwhile, Russian cities are seeing spontaneous memorials cropping up. They have been observed in St. Petersburg, where the office of the Wagner Group is located, as well as in Novosibirsk, Yekaterinburg and other cities, and Rostov-on-Don, a city captured by the group during a mutiny in July, a memorial has appeared in an unexpected location, specifically on the facade of a circus. This is the very spot where a tank that participated in Prigozhin's campaign against Moscow got stuck just a little over two months ago. Representatives of the Lukashenko regime have attended the BRICS summit which took place this week in the Republic of South Africa. In Belarus, there were hopes for the approval of the application to join the Economic Association. The question arises, why does Lukashenko seek BRICS membership? The Belarusian delegation participated in the BRICS summit held in the Republic of South Africa between the 22nd and the 24th of August. Prior to this event, the Lukashenko regime had submitted an application to join the association. The BRICS group currently comprises South Africa, China, India, Brazil and Russia. One goal is to compensate for the strained relations with the West, while the other is economic. There are opportunities to borrow money through a new development bank that provides loans. Additionally, there is an interest in trade with these countries because they are big. According to experts, BRICS accounts for a quarter of the world economy, a fifth of world exports and 40 percent of the planet's population. Belarusian state propaganda presents the organization as an alternative to the G7, which allegedly dances to the tune of the United States. BRICS is built on the principle of mutual equality among countries, each pursuing its own national interests. Regarding the United States, it may sound surprising, but some view BRICS's actions as a threat to the free world and capitalism. Furthermore, BRICS has plans to challenge the U.S. monetary hegemony by creating a new digital currency backed by gold. While plans to create a new currency do exist, it's important to note that although comparisons between BRICS and the Big Seven are valid, the organization should not be perceived solely as an anti-Western bloc. During the summit, Brazilian President Lula da Silva emphasized that BRICS has no intention to oppose the G7 or G20. No one wants to find themselves in the situation of Russia and Belarus and conflict with the West. Everyone wants to interact with the West and trade and just protect their interests, being united. Lukashenko's regime may be hoping that individual investors from BRICS members' countries who may not be as concerned about human rights in Belarus will come to support the Belarusian economy. However, it's important to note that the regime is still under Western sanctions. Compared to the BRICS participants, Belarus is a small country and a small economy. It's unlikely that anyone will want to risk relations with the West for small profits. The size of Belarus's economy in comparison to the BRICS countries is indeed quite modest. However, it's likely that Lukashenko has other goals in mind when submitting an application to join the association. One of these goals is to reduce dependence on Russia. Lukashenko wants to get out of isolation apart from everything else. He needs to fly somewhere on his Boeing before an arrest warrant from The Hague is issued, because Putin, as we can see, doesn't fly too much anymore. A total of 22 countries submitted their applications for joining BRICS. As it became known at the summit, six countries will join the organization from January 2024. But Belarus is not among them. These are Argentina, Egypt, Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia. However, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa said that BRICS will not be limited to one expansion phase. 
In the Krasnodar region, in the south of Russia, a scandal has erupted over the seizure of a sea beach in a resort village. The children's camp Smena has enclosed a portion of this popular recreation area with a fence and guard posts. Now this section of the beach is only accessible to the center staff and its campers. The children's camp justified its action by citing the necessity to protect its attendees due to concerns related to the war in Ukraine. Those who expressed dissatisfaction have been warned that they could face criminal prosecution for allegedly discrediting the Russian government. This summer, a large part of the beach by the Black Sea in the small village of Sukhoi in southern Russia has become inaccessible to tourists and locals. This public beach is considered one of the best on the coast. However, the state-owned children's recreation center, Smena, has announced that from now on, this territory belongs to them. A fence has been built and private guards have been hired to keep out unwanted guests. We will lose walks along our favorite routes. We will lose the beach. We will lose the guests of our village. Because if there is no beach, no one will come to our village. According to the water laws of Russia, the shores of any bodies of water must be publicly accessible, and the transfer of such areas into private ownership is illegal. It's unclear how the camp could claim ownership of the beach. According to the residents, this is a mistake made by a land registry official, which has already been confirmed by the court. The director of the Children's Center refuses to communicate with journalists and has provided a written explanation for the appearance of the fence. According to him, it's a precautionary measure due to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and those running the children's camp are concerned about potential sabotage. At the camp's beaches, various categories of people are sharing space with children. And this doesn't meet the safety requirements for children's recreation, creating risks of very dangerous situations. We have been talking about this problem for a long time, and in the conditions of the special military operation and attempts to carry out sabotage and terrorist acts on the territory of our country, it has become even more urgent. In addition to the beach, an entire street in the village is now enclosed by a fence. As a result, residents must pass through a checkpoint each time they want to access their homes, where they have to prove to the guards that they are not saboteurs. In order to go to my own house now, I have to show my pass, a residence pass. It says here that I am a resident. Among the locals, there are supporters of Russia's war with Ukraine. In the past, they even raised money for the Russian army. But because of the conflict near their homes, people have decided to change their priorities. I am now forced to transfer money not to help the army, but for legal aid, to have banners printed, to have leaflets printed for us. Local residents have already held several protests, written complaints to all authorities and sent two letters to President Vladimir Putin all to no avail. Now they say there is only one way out. People are signing an appeal to the leader of China, Xi Jinping. If no branch of government in our country can solve this issue, I think the Chinese leader will not leave us in trouble and will solve the issue with our beach. He will advise our president to solve the issue for the sake of the people and achieve a free beach. In response, the director of the Smena camp stated that the Children's Center has been founded by the Russian government, and he intends to view all actions of opponents as discrediting the state authorities. He has also threatened to file statements with the police and the investigative committee against those who expressed discontent. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Eastern Europe View. We'll be back next week with the news stories. I'm Alexandra Shapalina. Keep watching TVP World and see you next time.